Okay, guys, let's get ready to finish up the last set of notes we will ever have to take in this class. Um, just as a reminder from yesterday, we are still talking about the effects that urbanization has. So what we were um, talking about yesterday was the effect of acid rain, um, habitat fragmentation, and deforestation. So let's continue on with those effects and look at a couple more. One of big effect that um, urban areas have is something called a heat island. And yes, you need to write down all of this. Heat islands can change local weather patterns, which is um, one of their bigger effects. It can cause you to have more rain, more thunderstorms over the urban area than outside in the rural area. The air also becomes a trap for air pollutants. So cities are already more polluted than the rural areas. And then once you get this heat island, which is basically just a bubble of heat, um, it can cause even more pollutants to just get trapped there and not leave that urban area. So then all the people who are living there are going to be breathing in even more pollutants um, than they would have if it had not created a heat island. Heat islands can also make the urban area 5 to 9 degrees warmer than the right outside rural area. So they're, it, they're going to be warmer, aka that's why it's called a heat island. You're going to have some different weather patterns and then you also are going to trap some pollutants. The question is, why do we have a heat island to begin with? Well, think about what all your cities are made up of. Cities have a lot of pavement and they have a lot of um, building cement things like that that is going to cause the heat to be trapped there so if you have a street and pavement it's going to um, absorb all the solar energy and it's going to hold it hold it there that's why you can walk outside across the grass barefoot in the summer but as soon as you step on the road it's probably going to burn your feet because the pavement's trapping in a lot of heat um, and that's how the whole city is so all of the pavement is what creates that um, heat island. The other thing that makes the outside rural area cooler is one, it doesn't have any pavement. You can tell that by the picture or it doesn't have nearly as much, but it also has a lot more um, vegetation. As we've already looked at in the past, vegetation has a cooling effect on climate. So when you have the combination of the urban area being covered in pavement, absorbing heat, and then the rural area being covered in vegetation, which is um, which is allowing it to be cooled off. That's why you get that big temperature difference. That's why um, pollutants are getting trapped and that's why it can also change your weather patterns. So if you can't figure out that the heat island is caused because of pavement, then make a note somewhere on the slide based on that. So hopefully you are about done writing that and I'm going to move on. The next slide has a couple of pictures. So this is just showing you the one on um, this side is showing you why it is that you have more rain and that's because of the convection so we know that warm air rises and as you have that rising air it's going to cool and condense to create clouds so that's why it can change your weather patterns a little bit and then the one over here is simply showing you a graph so you have the actual rural area over here you have um, a downtown city area and then you have kind of like the suburbs which would be kind of like a winterville Suburb residential would be more um, Winterville right here. So you can see that the it starts off cooler and then it does go up and then it'll go back down. Um, the park has a nice little cooling effect. So I'd be interested to see in New York City what the difference would be with Central Park since that is such a large area. But that is your heat island and that's just to show you kind of what it causes, why it causes, and the temperature changes. People in urban areas also tend to produce a lot more pollution. So you're producing more pollution because they're using more energy. There's just more people around in general. So you have more litter that's occurring. You have more oil leaks occurring, stuff like that. But one particular type of air pollutant is called a chlorofluorocarbon. Everybody say chlorofluorocarbon. Um, chlorofluorocarbons are also called CFCs for short. Um, they, so you need to recognize them by both names, chlorofluorocarbon, because you don't know if they're going to write that out, but they also may only refer to them as a CFC. CFCs come from aerosols, so things like hairspray or spray paint, anything that sprays out of a can like that is what we call aerosol. Um, they also are released from old air conditioners and old refrigerators. And notice I'm saying old. Um, this is something that 
once they realize the big issue with CFCs, the technology has changed, so that way it's not as big of an issue now. The reason why CFCs are such a big issue is they deplete the ozone layer. And deplete simply means to get rid of the ozone layer. So what your chlorofluorocarbons were doing is they were putting holes in the ozone layer. And what does the ozone hole, um, layer, uh, what was it called, protect us from? It protects us from UV radiation. So that's a really big deal. We want to be protected from UV radiation. So I remember in school when we were learning about this, the refrigerators and stuff were still known to have your CFCs being released from it. Um, so it would, they would tell us, and this is something you should do anyway to conserve energy, but they would say, think about the snack that you want, open the fridge, see what they have, close it, and then decide what it is you want to eat. Because what most people do is they go home, they open the fridge, and they just stare at it for 10 minutes. And they just wait, like some new food is just going to magically appear in the middle of the refrigerator. Um, but our teachers had a really big emphasis of open the fridge, look, see what your options are, close it, think for that 10 minutes with the fridge closed, then open it and grab something. That way, one, you're saving energy, but two, you are not contributing to the holes on the ozone layer and the release of CFCs. Now, again, the technology has changed, so CFCs aren't as big of a thing, but your test will ask you what are some things that did release them. The aerosols refrigerators are the two main ones that they talk about. Um, so you should have that written down by now because it wasn't that much that was bolded. So let's keep going. Where does our trash go? Well, outside of going in the trash can and then on the side of the street and then into the dump truck, ultimately it's going to go to a landfill. So trash goes to a landfill. Make sure you know that. Um, landfills are carefully designed. They are not just a big thing of just trash dump somewhere. There's actually a lot of engineering goes that goes into them. Landfills also have a liner on the bottom of them. You can think of the liner as being like a giant trash bag. Sometimes it's a clay liner, sometimes it's a plastic liner. But the reason they have a liner is to prevent the, um, the water, because it's going to rain on the landfill, they don't want all that trash to leach down into the groundwater. So if you have a liner, uh, either clay or um, plastic, it will help prevent um, leaching or leachate from going into the groundwater. And nobody wants to drink that. Think about, I don't know if any of you have ever taken the trash out and there was some like unknown mystery liquid in the bottom of the trash can. And as you walk across the kitchen to go take it outside, it kind of drips on you. Well, that's absolutely disgusting. Now think about if you had to drink that, okay? Um, think about all those other people's trash. You know it's in your trash can, but think about what other people are throwing away. All that mystery liquid at the bottom of it. The last thing you want is for that to get into your groundwater, especially when there's probably toxic metals that are also leaching um, from batteries and who knows what else that's being thrown away. Um, so I'm going to give you one more second to finish writing this. Um, but that's why it's so important to have that liner to protect our groundwater. Um, on the next slide, I am going to have a video of a landfill for y'all to see. And it's, it's amazing to see just how much stuff people throw away that they could recycle. Um, especially, I know with our house, we fill up the recycle bin every week and our trash can is never full. Um, because so much stuff can be recycled and not have to go to landfill. So you should be done by now. So let's keep going. Um, some landfills will heak or leak harmful waste into the soil and water. That has to do with the leaching. If you already wrote something about leaching on the last slide, you can ignore that. Um, if not, go ahead and write it down. But some landfills will leak stuff, and that's the impact of the urban area. Because remember, your urban area has so many people, so there's so much trash, and it get making the contaminating the soil and water is a really bad thing. The other thing that people do, and this is just a really I don't know, just stupid thing people do is um, they will get these chemical drums. And this isn't the majority of people, but sometimes this happens. You will have a company who is required to dispose of a hazardous waste in a certain method that costs them money. Well, in order to save money, they will put that hazardous waste into these chemical drums and then they will bury them and they won't think about it again. Well, the thing is, 
that buried drum is going to weather away. It's going to rust. It's going to break. And then it's going to leak out all that stuff into the groundwater. Um, so this is a very illegal thing to do because um, the government's trying to protect people, not let those chemicals that no one knows about, no one knows where they are, no one knows to watch out for them, get in people's well water or groundwater. Um, so that is a very bad thing to do. If you ever own a company, don't do that. Okay, but I'm going to let you go ahead and pause the video while you switch and watch the landfill video. Okay, hopefully you learned something from the landfill video and maybe that will make you think more about the things you throw away. Um, so waste is going to happen and you don't need to write this down because this is pretty much review. Um, waste is going to happen no matter what, but we've got to find a way to reduce the waste and to make disposal safer. And a big way to do this is by recycling. Recycling is going to reduce how much stuff is actually going in the landfill. It's also going to save energy because then we can turn those um, materials into something else to be made again. Um, and it's just going to also save, the whole deal with it saving space is a really big thing because, um, again, with our growing population, we need more space. And if we're taking up all of our space with trash that doesn't need to be thrown away in the first place because it should have been recycled, um, that just isn't going to, that, that's a trend that's not going to work out in the long run. Um, Greenville's landfill is already completely full and we've had to switch over to another county's landfill um, because of how much trash that we personally all produce. So make sure that you are recycling whenever you possibly can. Okay, now I'm going to let you find Santa Claus. So I'll pause and give you a second to do that. Usually people find Santa Claus pretty quickly here. If you haven't, then he is right here. Good old Saint Nick. Oh, this may be harder for you to find because of the dorsary thing. But y'all like a challenge, so it's okay. But Santa Claus is right down there at the little arrow pointing to him if you can see his beard. Okay, I got a couple more of these as a nice little brain break for you. Like a Where's Waldo. Um, so which of these letters is the odd one out? I'm going to let you pause this video for a moment while you think about it. When you figure it out, don't blurt out the answer. Make sure you give people a chance to think. Go ahead and pause. Okay, our next um, set of notes is going to be on human impact and the environment. But before I move on to that, I should probably go ahead and tell you the answer. Um, the letter that is the odd one out is L. And that's because L is the only one that takes two lines to make it. So one, two. All the other letters are made up of three lines. So A, you have one, two, three. Z, one, two, three. And the Y has one, two, three. And so on and so on. So L is the odd one out because it is only made up of two lines. So there's a little riddle, but now we can continue on with our notes. So how do people impact the environment? Okay, each year, um, and again, just write the bold apart for this one, but each year Americans throw away 30 million cell phones, which is absolutely ridiculous. Those cell phones can all be recycled, by the way. Not in your normal recycling bin, but you can take them places to get recycled, and all you have to do is do a quick Google search for that. 18 million computers, 8 million TVs, and enough tires to circle the world three times. With 6% of the world's populations, Americans use one-third of all the resources and produce one-third of all the garbage. That is absolutely ridiculous. And again, it's so easy just to be like, wow, America is so awful. Um, we are the Americans that are doing this. America, Americans are simply using a lot of stuff because, again, we are blessed to have a higher standard of living than many places around the world. And because of that, we don't think about the things that we are using and wasting because to us it's normal. So what you have to do is not get mad at other people for what they are wasting, but you need to take a stop and take a look at your life. 
What are stuff that you're wasting? What stuff that you could be recycling that you're not recycling? Is it because you're lazy and you could just simply do a little Google search and take whatever to the proper place to get um, the discarded correctly? I know that I ha I'm very guilty of that. Um, with TVs and tires and computers, those things can all be recycled and they are some of the best things to recycle because of the metals that are within them. Um, a lot of them are very limited resources, but it, uh, it's easy to just dump it in a trash can instead of Googling and driving, you know, four miles down the road and dropping it off somewhere. Um, but that's the stuff that we need to start doing. Be inconvenienced a little bit because this st statistic is ridiculous. 6% of the world's population using one-third of resources and producing one-third of the garbage. If we recycled, that would make our garbage number go way down and it would make our resource number go way down because if we recycled the things that we're using, we wouldn't have to keep using new resources to recreate the same thing. Um, so make sure that you are evaluating your waste and doing the best that you can. Um, these are some pictures um, from the early 70s. So you have a river that has caught on fire about three times. Um, that's what that smoke is. And for a river to catch on fire, you know there's got to be something wrong with that water. That water is extremely polluted. Um, the other picture is the city, and you can see the smog within it. Um, and that smog is just ridiculous. Imagine if you have asthma breathing that in. And then the one on the bottom is a picture of all the trash that had been washed up on the beach. Now, the things got to this point, and Americans were like, okay, this is ridiculous. And that's what that current president was thinking as well. So we passed a couple of laws. So how do we prevent these things? Well, we need to conserve and we need to prevent pollution. Um, remember, we are a part of the ecosystem. So again, this all goes back to taking up personal responsibility, not getting mad at everybody else for their issues, but take personal responsibility and then um, encourage others to do the same. Um, so reduce, reuse, um, our, the triple R's, reduce, reuse, recycle, Conservation, by the way, in case you haven't gotten this definition since we started talking about this, is simple, simply the careful and intentional use of resources. So if you don't know that, go ahead and write that down. But conservation is just when we are carefully and intentionally using our resources. Um, I know that I, I have the little red bins that have markers and stuff in it, and I usually keep sticky notes in there. And I, I know that I've had students in the past who will just get the pencils and start breaking them for no reason at all. Um, or they will get pen and start just writing a dollar sign on every single sticky note that I have, making it so that it can't be used by other students. That is not careful use. That is not intentional use. That is wasteful use. And that's annoying because it's not your stuff to mess with anyway. Um, but that's just a pet peeve of mine. Um, so think about the things that you have. Are you carefully, intentionally using them? And are you recycling them? So these are the laws that were passed. You've already written down the Clean Water Act, so no need to rewrite this. Um, this is just a review. The Clean Water Act simply stopped point source pollution. So it was saying that industries couldn't dump raw sewage or waste directly into water. That wastewater had to be treated. And that's what helped prevent um, things like that river from catching on fire and all the trash being washed up on the shore. Because this law was passed, um, this water that was safe to fish and swim in, it was 36%. And then it jumped all the way up to 62% of water in the U.S. was safe to swim in um, and within the span of only 20 years. And again, these laws were passed in the early 70s. Safe Drinking Water Act. We've already learned about this one as well, so it's just review. Um, but this act set the set ma um, max amount of containment lab labels per water. So this is just saying... When you clean water, it's got to be up to a certain standard before you can sell it to people and or provide it to people th throughout the cities and whatnot. So we are very thankful for this because this is what ensures that our drinking water is safe um, and not just extremely messed up. We know what should be in our water. The Clean Air Act. This is a new one. So in this time, there were we looked at the two water laws already. This was another law that was passed um, very simple or very similar um, to the Safe Drinking Water Act, but this has to do with air. So this made it so that the air pollutants, um, because of all the smog that was growing in certain areas, it was causing a lot of health problems. 
And so what this law was saying is that if a city knows that there are too many air pollutants in the air, then the local authorities have to come up with a plan to bring them down. So um, the cities will have something that can test the air quality and test for certain pollutants. And if those levels get too high, it is their responsibility where they must figure out how to make the um, pollutant, pollution levels come down. And that makes it safer and better for us to breathe. Um, power, this is the reason a lot of power plants and vehicles have pollution control devices. Um, part of the reason why when we get our cars inspected, they check for that. This is another reason why a lot of states are put, making a big switch towards clean energy um, because they have to get pollutant levels down. And that's all thanks to the Clean Air Act, which we are very happy about. Okay. Hopefully you're about done writing that. Make sure that you know the difference between the three laws and you don't get them confused. Um, because a lot of people, because this is called the Clean Air Act, they get it confused with the Clean Water Act with how it's worded. Um, but remember, Clean Air Act is similar to Safe Drinking Water Act with a set max of limits. And the Clean Water Act was simply stopping point source pollution. Okay, next. Oh, no. Um, there is no Where's Waldo, which some of you may not even know about. And the slide hasn't switched yet. One second. There we go. So this is Find Santa. So I'll let you pause the video for a second while you find Santa. Okay, if you've not found Santa yet, here he is. Right here, there's Santa hiding behind the igloo, silly guy. Okay, let's. I have another one, and this time it's Where's Waldo? I know that Waldo may be before some of y'all's time, so this is a picture of Waldo. He's always wearing the red and white striped shirt, and he has a hat, and he has glasses and brown hair. So take a good look at this guy, and the next slide you're going to find a picture of where is Waldo. He's hiding amongst the crowd. So as you look for Waldo, I'm going to let you pause the video while you try to find him. Okay, I believe this is him right here in the middle. And this is Waldo's evil twin. Um, but there's Waldo. And we got another one. So go ahead and pause the video and find Waldo. Okay, and Waldo is right here in the corner. There he is. Yay, Waldo. Okay, I got one more thing for y'all. It's not Waldo, though. Oh, I lied to you. This is, there's, where's Waldo? And then I have one more thing for you. So find Waldo in this bakery. Hopefully you pause the video to find him. If not, go ahead and pause it because I'm about to tell you the answer. But Waldo is right here. There's Waldo. Okay, and now for my last thing, which is not a where's Waldo. Tracy's mother, and if you know the answer, don't blurt it out. That's just annoying. Um, Tracy's mother had four children. The first child was named April. The second was named May. The third, June. What was her fourth child called? Um, go ahead and pause the video while you think about the answer. Okay, and the answer is Tracy. The fourth child's name was Tracy because we're talking about Tracy's mom. So they had one child, two child, three child, four child. Um, so there is the answer. Okay, now that you've had your nice little brain break, let's keep going. Protecting land resources. So now we're going to look at how we can protect land resources. If you want to write this as like a heading for the next stuff that we talk about, that would be great. So how do we protect our land resources? Well, the first thing that we need to do is protect soil. And here are the ways that we protect soil. Um, 
Ugh, the slide hasn't changed, but it will in just one second. There we go. And stick with me, people, because we don't have a whole lot left. So how do we protect our land resources? Well, farmers protect soil with a lot of different conservation practices, one of those being contour plowing. Now, I still want you to list contour plowing and crop rotation, um, but we've already talked about them, so there's no need to rewrite their definitions. So remember, contour plowing is when you plow along the contours or the sides of hills. Um, this will decrease both runoff and erosion, and it looks like a staircase going up a hill, which is what this picture right here is referring to. Um, crop rotation is when we alter, I'm skipping down here, so crop rotation is when we alternate what plants we grow each year. So one year we grow corn, the next year we grow soybeans. And the purpose of that is to keep nutrients in the soil so you don't have to use as much fertilizer. Now the new one that we've not talked about is going to be your um, strip cropping. So strip cropping is what this picture right here is showing. It's when you have one row um, of a plant with a different nutrient requirement as what's next to it. So maybe I'm planting a row of corn and then a row of soybean and then a row of corn again and then another row of soybeans. So you're just alternating what rows. Now there's a few good things about this. One, it keeps nutrients in the soil. Why? Because you have things next to one another that are using up different nutrients. So it's not going to zap everything from the soil it's going to be kind of a mix. It also will help prevent erosion. So if I'm planting, notice this farmer planted a tall crop here and a short crop here. This tall crop is going to prevent erosion going on from that shorter crop. So it's going to keep the nutrients in the soil and it's going to prevent erosion. The other thing that it can do is help prevent pests. So pests like to move in, remember if it's a monoculture, Pests will move in and they will destroy an entire crop. Um, but if the pests move into this area, if they really like corn, they're not going to destroy the whole crop. They're only going to destroy this one row of things. Um, and the rest of it will be fine. So you, when you use strip cropping, you use less fertilizer and you use less pesticides and you lose less soil. So all of those things are very, very good with strip cropping. Um, so... Uh, if you still are writing, um, y'all can pause for a second, but hopefully you're done since it's only a sentence. And let's keep going. Protection against beach and mountain erosion. So basically, to protect against mountain erosion, all you do is plant vegetation along the sides of mountains. We know that vegetation's roots um, anchor down the soil, and that's why it prevents erosion. So on a mountainside, the best thing that you can do is plant some vegetation. Now, at one point, people are like, oh, let's look at this cheap, really nice, pretty vegetation called kudzu. And so they planted kudzu, and this is a picture of it right here. But we know that kudzu, it was originally from Japan and is an invasive species. So they didn't just plant it on the mountainside. It took over the mountainside. Um, so all you have to do to protect against mountain erosion is plant vegetation. Okay. And you can put that in your own words. So if you're not done copying it, then you can figure it out. Protect against mountain erosion equals plant vegetation. Last thing we have to look at until we're done with the notes is beach erosion. So there's two forms of um, protection against beach erosion. One is called hard stabilization. And hard stabilization has your seawalls and jetties, so know that. So anytime you talk about... Um, Seawalls or jetties, that's an example of hard stabilization. And then we have something called soft, stabiliz soft stabilization, which is beach nourishment. And on the next couple slides, I'll just explain what a seawall and jetty is and then what beach nourishment is. So go ahead and write this down. And the poor guy that lives at this house, because um, he has just, well, one, he has a really big head and weird eyes. But look at all the ground that has just eroded from his beach house. Um, definitely don't want that. Maybe if they had a seawall, he would have been okay. But let's keep going. So let's look at seawalls and jetties. Jetties simply stabilize. Um, they go in a river opening. So let's see. You can write jetties stabilize where rivers open into oceans. Um, and then you just need to know that they're effective short-term. 
So jetties stabilize the channels where the rivers are opening up into the ocean. So if you look at this picture up here, you have jetties. So they're these things that jet out into the water, which is why they are called jetties. So this is the river, and the river is opening up to the ocean, so the water's going this way. This is also the way the ships would go. Um, and all of a sudden, the ocean has a lot of waves. So what you don't want is for where this road is to all get eroded away. So these jetties go out and they help kind of soften the current. So that way you have um, less erosion occurring. Typically, your current is going at an angle. And so on one side of the jetty, you get an area of deposition. And the other side of the jetty will still eventually get eroded away. That's why these are very short-term solutions. They are not a long-term. So jetties where rivers open to oceans, effective in the short term. And that's all for jetties. Let's go ahead and look at what a seawall is. I guarantee you've all seen a seawall at some point, even if you don't know it. Um, so a seawall is simply a wall that protects against strong waves. So you can just write that. Seawall protects I put like against strong waves. So they protect against strong waves. And you can have a seawall that's just a wall that's literally built standing up like this one. Or sometimes they're angled seawalls. And the purpose of these is as waves crash down. Oh, and you need to write down there also a short-term solution. Um, as the waves crash down, they don't take away the dirt. They just hit the wall. Um, so they are going to protect against erosion but they are also considered a short-term solution. So seawalls protect against strong waves. They are a short-term solution. If you write anything more than that, you are writing too much because you don't need to know anything else. Um, I'm just stalling because I know some of you are slow writers. But anyway, those are your seawalls, hopefully. This one, obviously, there's a ladder stairs going down here. When the tide rises, um, it will go up, um, and as the tide, but it will never go higher than this wall up here, um, not unless there's a hurricane and a storm surge. But that just helps protect against those waves as the tide changes, and we know tides are caused by gravity. And I'm done stalling, so let's go to our next slide. Soft stabilization. This is beach nourishment. Um, beach nourishment is simply when you get a dump truck of sand and you dump it back on the beach. So this is a short-term solution. So you have a dump truck, dump truck of sand and dump it on the beach. Obviously, this is a short-term solution because as those waves hit, they are just going to immediately take that sand right back out. But when you go to places like Florida or um, the Bahamas or wherever, if they, Wrightsville Beach, whatever, wherever it is, if people actually want to go to a beach to lay on, to sit on, to go to, and if the beach is eroding away, then sometimes those places have to simply build back the um, shoreline by just bringing back more sand. Now sometimes they can get sand from the ocean and just pump it up um, back onto the shore but that also is a little bit hard because the amount of water that's in the ocean. Um, the water comes up with the sand and then can cause more erosion. So other times, um, sometimes places will buy sand from other places. So if you're at a nice resort and they want their sand to have nice white sandy beaches, they may buy sand from a place that naturally has white sand and then bring it in. But anyway, that is what soft stabilization is. Let's go ahead and move on. Hopefully you're done writing that. And let's clear the screen. Next, if you didn't get these notes, y'all can go back in from somebody else because we are almost done. So the only long-term solution is prevention, okay? The long-term solution to beach erosion is prevention, and the best way to prevent it is on the sand dunes to plant grasses. So that's the best way to prevent your beach erosion. And that's officially all the notes. Oh my goodness, we are all done, and I know that you all are just so happy you could cry tears of joy 
but also tears of sorrow because if you're watching this video, that means I'm not here and you miss me. But that's okay. Um, for the next couple days, we are going to be doing review. You have everything you need online. Um, you can email me um, and let me know if you have questions or you can ask one of the other science teachers because they've all taught earth science before. Um, but mostly just look up your notes because you have it all in your notes. Use your classmates to the best of your ability. If you don't get something, I guarantee someone in this room understood it and they can review it um, with you. So for the next couple of days, um, the instructions for your um, review, they will be explained to you. I do have a review sheet that you'll be working on that's broken up into chunks and that makes it doable for y'all because you have a certain amount to get done each day. Um, and my students who have really put an effort on these review sheets have done really well. The students who got it done but didn't put in effort, they didn't do so well. So if you want to do well, because remember your NCFE is 25% of your grade, make sure you're putting in effort for this review. You get out of it what you put in, and if you put in laziness, you're not going to get much of anything out of it. So please work hard, finish strong. Y'all are so close to being done. I miss you all, and um, I hope you have a wonderful day.